Um, so, uh, the seating chart has changed and is likely to change again next month. So, um, and this is heat. So, thanks for your quality on that. Um, but I apologize coming in late, so I'm going to be rough. That uh, for regular business, if the approval of the uh, uh, agenda for today. Um, I would make a motion to approve the agenda for today. I'll second. I have a second to approve the agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Approval of the uh, November 15th minutes. Will we approve the minutes? Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, item C, director's report. Uh, just a couple of things before we get started on the, uh, the presentation on the administration report. Uh, the adopted uh, unified uh, planning work program is on the WAMPO website uh, for your review and, and consideration. It's listed under the uh, Our People heading. I'm not real sure of that why, but uh, that's under there. Uh, we're now starting to make the uh, assignments on the sub activities. And there are 35 sub activities that we'll be working on over the course of this year. And hopefully we'll have the majority of them taken care of at the end of this year, uh, and into this, the second phase of the, uh, the planning work programs. Uh, the final budget for the UPWP was 1.426 million. And that includes the Wichita transit funds. Uh, just the WAMPO share is 1.146 million. And that's to take care of the, uh, the 33 uh, subtopics and activities. And uh, prior to uh, Vicki's presentation on the administration report and, and adoption, I think you saw in her staff report all of the different things that are going on right now. And I just wanted to commend her for the excellent job that she did in putting all this together. And with that, I would call on her to uh, some details on the uh, administrative report and the 457 pension adoption. Thank you. Good afternoon. Vicki Forbes, Human Resources and Finance Manager for WEMPO. Just wanted to kind of give you a brief overview of the administration report. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about how did we get to where we are today. In 2014, Wichita State um, Hugo Wall Public Policy and Management Center entered, we entered into a contract agreement with them to research various administrative service options. In the fall of 2015, we hired our director, Phil Nelson, to lead WEMPO in moving forward towards becoming autonomous. The research that was done by Hugo Wall produced three options for the Transportation Policy Body Board to consider. And in late 2015 and early 2016, discussion of the pros and cons of each of the options that took place over several of those meetings. Um, and the outcome was for WAMPO to start putting in place the necessary processes to become independent within 18 months. So during 2016, staff worked to put in place the necessary items to make WAMPO become independent beginning January 1 of 2017. Those items include moving out of City Hall into the Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan Building, which is located here at 271 West 3rd Street, and we are in Suite 208. Nice facility, by the way. During 2016, um, WEMPO, over the year, we entered into contract agreements or letters of engagements with the following consultants and organizations. Right now, we are still working with the city of Wichita on a fiscal agent, and there's not a problem with it. We just, with everything that's going on, we just haven't had time to complete it. Um, but we were told we would backdate it, and everything's still moving forward. We entered into Allen, uh, AGH, Allen Gibbs, and Hulick. They are our payroll consultant. They will do such things as distribute our payrolls, take up the deductions out of it, standard deductions, and process any garnishments or any court-ordered um, payments that have to be done. The rest of that will be back on WAMPO staff, myself, 
to pay out like our health benefits and everything to our health providers. We also um, have a letter of interest, or I'm sorry, engagement letter with AGH Wealth Management, which is our investment advisory. And this particular person, Clark Armour, is the one who sat with us and worked with us on our pension plan or our 457 plan. He got us each enrolled into our pension plan and he will advise us over the year as to the different accounts. Um, we have access to look at our own accounts, but he will also advise us on our accounts and he's there for us. We do pay them a fee. For the year it costs $3,500 and they bill us each quarter. We did a letter of engagement with Hinkle Law Firm to establish our 457 plan because you have to have all the legal documents in place and they charge $2,900 to do this for us and to get us all set up. We also did a letter of engagement to establish our welfare benefits plan, which is our health care, our vision, and our uh, dental. And for that plan, it was $2,300 to do it. We were also able to pay for those two items out of our 2016 budget. Our pension plan is held by One America, which is the parent company under American United Life Insurance Company. Qualified Plans is our third party company that we use. And the difference between them and um, AGH Wealth Management. AGH is our person who works with the employees on advising them on what they should or how they should do their money. Qualified Plans is the company that works on the backside to make sure that we stay in compliance, to make sure that we are um, employees are qualified, and that all of our documents when it comes tax time and everything are in place. We, um, I went out and started with the city's insurance company, Edna. They referred me to Doug Dixon, who is a broker, to help me look for an insurance company. And with Doug, he was very good to work with. And what he did was he uh, gave a couple of proposals to Phil and I, and we went through them and looked at them. Our medical insurance is going to be through Unite Healthcare because this is the closest to what the city currently has and we wanted to keep our employees whole. We also entered into agreement um, Unite Healthcare Benefit Services, which is going to act as our benefit, uh, I'm sorry, our cafeteria plan for our employees so that they can, when they have their benefits taken out, it's pre-tax. We have Delta Dental which is the same plan that they had with the city of Wichita. And we have Surancy Vision, and this plan is very close to the same um, vision plan that they also have with the city of Wichita. There are some additional consultants and agencies that we still need to get on board with us. We need to um, see if we can enter into a contract to have a car rental in case we ever need that, we have employees that need to go out of town, they need to have a car, because we no longer have access to the city's fleet. So right now, employees are using their own cars and they are being reimbursed with mileage. But if we ever run into the situation where they do need to be able to rent a car, we need to have something in place. And I've started kind of talking with Wichita State about who they're using to see if maybe we can piggyback on their contract or if that same company would work with us because we are a small group and kind of give us that discount rate still. Never hurts to try. We also have to get a broker for our liability insurance since we are no longer under the city. And um, these are about the last two things we still need to clean up as far as consultants. There are some in-house things we still need to take care of. We're going to go back, well, I'm going to go back to the employee handbook. There are some things that we will actually take out of that handbook due to our size that we no longer need to have in that book. And it will get finalized, I would say, within the next two months or less. And there are some modifications to some of the policies and procedures that we are currently underneath with the city of Wichita, which 
we can't veer too far from them because the city is still our fiscal agent. Um, so we have to stay in compliance so that they can continue to stay in compliance. But they have visit with me and there are some things that we can kind of tweak and make it more conducive to the way we like to run WAMPO. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Janet, Janet has a, Janet Miller has a question. Oh. Hey, thanks for your presentation. Just a couple of questions. One is, um, <coughs> no. Okay. I think of us as a public entity, which makes me think we need to bid out for services, but it doesn't sound like we did that. It's, it's what's the situation there? We don't we are not required to. Well, actually, we did. What we did was we started with a bid for our payroll services. And we had two that came back. Um, and then we went through the selection process that the city actually uses. So we went with AGH. And under AGH, when we start working with them with payroll, they brought in some people. Now, one of the people I did not go with under who they brought in, because that's who they're used to working with and getting things set up, set up was their broker for their health insurance because I had went out to look for a health insurance provider. Um, and in the state of Kansas, there are only a few um, providers that you can have. And so actually the, the broker with AGH wanted me to give them the information that the other broker had already done the work on because he said it would be the same thing, but he would have to release it and give it to him, which was not fair to the one who had done the work. So we did not use that one. By going through AGH, these were the people that they recommended um, to set up our paperwork because they all work together and tie in together with each other. Well, I guess we will still be bound. Yeah. Like what spurred my question was your comment about, I think, the health insurance and one other, the broker question. So since we didn't go with AGH, did we go out for bids from the, for the, other, from the other companies to choose a health insurance company? I did not go out for bids. What I did was I went with Aetna, who, is, who the city is underneath now, to find out if it was possible for us to use that insurance and keep it the same. Aetna referred me to this broker because there are only two insurance companies in the state of Kansas who will provide services to a group our small. that's as small as we are. Okay. I guess I would ask our legal counsel, uh, yes. are we okay there? Yeah, what, what happened was, and it's a very good question, okay, we went out for uh, a bid, okay, request for proposal for administrative services, okay? We were seeking a catch-all entity that would facilitate um, all of these services that were, um, that, are, that are being engaged in individually by WAMPO, okay? So the proposals that came back were from two, in it, uh, I think there were at least two, if not three entities, that uh, provided a proposal for an all-encompassing uh, provision of administrative services. What Vicki is describing is, is the relationships with each of those individual entities that germinated from that administrative services proposal originally bid on um, and awarded to AGH. Um, those individual providers um, underneath that broad overarching administrative services RFP um, instead of having the relationship passed directly through AGH um, without some type of a letter of engagement because they need certain types of access um, working on behalf of our, our individual employees at WAMPO, um, they are coming through directly through um, for letter of engagement uh, with WAMPO. But the actual administrative services RFP, which incorporated all of these services that we're talking about was competitively procured. So we did go through a competitive procurement process, um, engaging all of our normal partners as we go through um, through the with the state of Kansas as well. So we are covered on on that basis. But that's why you're seeing these letters of engagement that come out separately. It's a it's a distinct portion of the overarching um, uh, competitive procurement process. I, was that helpful? I hope. Yes. Oh. Yes. My, my second, thank you. My second question also probably is for you. Uh, on our employee handbook, have we have you reviewed that from a legal perspective? A lot of companies fail to do that and realize they have not a good handbook when they get sued by an employee, and that's a bad time to find it out. Have, uh, it's another good question. He will review it before it goes to the employees. Okay. 
Um, some of the things we took out of there was from the city. We've looked at it, and I've touched base with Austin, so I'm going to need you to look over our handbook before it actually goes to the employees. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sir, Carl. Um, do we uh, currently still operate under the city's liability insurance? Not or, anymore. So there is no liability insurance currently? No. That's not a good situation, I don't think. No. It, and that's why we're going to get that done just as soon as we can. There's a lot of set, there was a lot of work. Seems to me Pete ought to park his car outside, and I think that ought to be our temporary. <laughs> <laughs> And it's a matter of, you know, with the liability we have to sort through, we actually have to tell them what liabilities we want, what we don't want. Some of it, the liability is already covered by the county because we're in a county building. Um, our liability is going to be more so with things that happen with WAMPO. It's what we want to have covered. How soon do you expect that to uh, be in place? Um, I'd say by the middle of February, Tell me go through the whole process. Yes, yeah. Follow up question on that liability insurance. Is that, how are we covered as board members? Are we covered under our own jurisdictions for serving on here or do we need to have some equivalent of DNO insurance, liability insurance for, as, as for the board? Uh, when we procure um, liability insurance for WAMPO, a, a portion of that will go to the officers and employees um, for acts, errors, and omissions. Um, I think right now you are all serving as official representatives of your individual jurisdictions. And so um, I, depending on, I would assume all of your jurisdictions have individual errors and omissions insurance. And so as designated official acts, I think there's probably some potential overlap for coverage. Um, but I, that's how we're going to deal with it because we want to have our own WAMPO coverage, errors and, errors and emissions for our officers and employees. Okay. Other questions? Um, so I think you, you know, a year ago is when we decided as a policy body to uh, go this route to become independent. So it was the will of the, of the body to, uh, to do this. I think we see the, uh, it's not easy when you're starting up a company to, to handle all this. And you, know, you look at all that, all of that was provided under the previous, uh, having the city of Wichita do all of that. So <clears throat> to spin off all of that, except for city of Wichita will remain the fiscal agent until we're able to accumulate, uh, enroll that quarterly. Uh, if you recall, money comes in quarterly after the fact. So, uh, but other than that, I think we've done a pretty good job in becoming independent in, in a matter of a year, plus living in a new building here. So any other questions? I guess we need to entertain a, uh, did you have something, Tom? Okay. Um, I think we, it's a, it's a voted we, that we adopt this uh, plan. If I entertain a motion for that. Moved. Okay. okay. And Claire, thank you. Any other comments? Being none, all in favor signify aye. 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 All in opposed? Okay. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, next is the consent agenda, but there are not any items on the consent agenda this month. Uh, next is public comment. If there's anybody from public wants to speak or address the policy body. Okay. Last chance. New business items. Um, we have a, uh, do I want to announce this right now? Okay. Before we new business, uh, we do have some new ex officio members on the board, two of them, <laughs> Rick Backland. He's the division administrator for the federal highway FHWA administration in the Kansas division. And also the second one would be mock T Ahmad. He's a regional administrator for the federal transit administration administration, the FTA, in our region. So we welcome them as part of our meetings and, uh, and, and uh, they're non-voting as way I understand it. And so, uh, but it's nice to have the uh, FHWA and the FTA want to want to attend our meetings and be a part of these. I think that's very helpful. Um, 
Is Mr. Blackman want to address anything? You want to address us? Welcome. Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And actually, later on the agenda, I was going to give a, kind of an update um, <clears throat> about some you know, recent programs going on and transition for the administration. But uh, just a little bit about myself. I've been with Federal Highway Administration 29 years. I came here from Southern California. I was director of our Southern California office. I've worked in, I was director of the South Carolina division for a number of months. I've worked in a number of states. I've worked in policy and planning and operations. And before Federal Highways, I worked at Texas DOT, but I'm a certified planner. I'm an AICP as well as an engineer. But then I have Paul Foundukas on my staff here providing right. support. But uh, definitely pleasure to be here. And if we can provide, you know, the thought was for us to provide the board support as needed as, as key documents and processes are Perfect. discussed. So. Okay. Well, I think that's a, a great addition, Rick. Thanks for being here. I understand Mokti is not here, but. Yeah, know. unfortunately, Mokti was not able to be here. He's actually in Washington this week for, for meetings, as you, I'm sure you folks are aware. In the next two weeks, we're having some major transitions, so lots going to be <laughs> happening. But later on the agenda, I'm going to be talking about some of the key okay. products we're coming out with. Okay. Thank you. Um, next, uh, planning consideration. Wait, uh, sorry, new business items. Uh, we're going to have a review of the open meeting protocol from Mr. Austin Parker. This would probably be a good refresher for all of us anyway. So, could I ask that the cameras be turned off for this part? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't have, that my presentation doesn't have to live in infamy. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, thanks, Austin. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I I realize that many of you have gone through at least one, if not several, Kansas Open Meetings Act presentations in your uh, lifetime of service as a uh, governing body members and public officials. Uh, this will be yet another one. Uh, I'm going to try to keep it as interesting as possible. But if you have any questions or comments, feel free to jump in in the middle of it, or you can save them till the end. I'm sure we'll have time thereafter. OK. I want to start us off with um, our, a statement out of the WAMPO bylaws um, that specifically addresses the Kansas Open Meetings Act. It explains meetings will be held in accordance with COMA. Uh, Robert's Rules of Order shall govern the conduct of meetings who are not otherwise specifically provided by these bylaws. The presiding officer shall have authority to limit discussion or presentation uh, by members and non-members of the TPB or take other appropriate actions necessary to conduct all business in an orderly manner. Um, additionally, uh, the TAC, TPB, and its executive committee are entities subject to the requirements of COMA. Okay? This is a recitation of what's already um, the requirements of, of the Kansas Open Meetings Act as we are a um, public body. Here we go. <coughs> Definition of a meeting, okay? Now you're going to see some language that is, is uh, lined through, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, but that's in there for historical context. Some of you will remember when this language was in effect, depending on how long you have been serving as public officials. But it used to say all prearranged, now just all gatherings by a majority of uh, a, not a quorum of, but, but a majority of legislative and administrative bodies, agencies of the state, political and taxing subdivisions, including boards, commissions, authorities, councils, committees, subcommittees, and other subordinate groups, thereof receiving or expending and supported in whole or in part by public funds shall be open to the public when the purpose of the gathering is to discuss, conduct, or transact the business or affairs of the body or agency. In 2008, the legislature removed the language requiring a meeting to be prearranged before it came within the act and removed the majority of a quorum definition of a meeting. We used to have in the state of Kansas, a, some of you will recall, um, a, a definition of a quorum which would would more severely limit how many individuals, governing body members, could have a discussion um, before it became an open meeting, subject to coma. Uh, they removed that distinction. Um, so we still reference quorum, and we'll talk about this later in our bylaws. But officially, the, the word quorum has largely been removed from the statute, so it's really just majority of the governing body. Um, that's what constitutes a meeting. 
Okay. What types of things should be open under the Canvas Open Meetings Act? Work sessions. Work sessions should be open. Informal planning gatherings by a majority of a governing body held prior to, during, or after a regularly scheduled meeting should be open. So it happens often. We do them sometimes here, but it happens often wherever governing bodies meet that they'll have a workshop before or after, a lot of times during budget season. Those are open meetings as well as a regular meeting. Meetings with another group, uh, a joint city school board meeting or a meeting with, I think the example in the Attorney General's opinion, League of Women's Voters should be open. Um, telephone calls between a majority of the members of a governing body in which governmental business is discussed should be open. Um, this board has never, uh, I believe, had to establish a meeting such as this, but uh, I represent a board that covers the majority of western Kansas, and I don't believe that they've ever had a majority of their governing body actually physically in the room. It, it, they always, almost always establish their meeting by telephone, and that's permissible. Um, you can have a speakerphone that, that allows you to participate. In the past, chance meetings were not covered by COMA. However, under the 2008 definition of a meeting, this, cha this rule changed so that all meetings between a majority of the members of the governing body were where business of the governmental entity is discussed are covered. And that's a very distinct, very important distinction, okay? Um, there's going to be occasions, uh, depending on the size of the jurisdictions where you come from, it may be more uh, frequent than not, that you'll run into a majority of a governing body. Here, maybe a little bit different because our jurisdictions are geographically spread, but um, if there is an event, other or otherwise, where a majority of the uh, WAMPO TPB or one of its subsidiaries, like the uh, executive committee, um, are meeting, um, if they're not discussing the business of the governmental entity, then we're not specifically talking about something that falls underneath the scope of the Open Meetings Act, okay? It's got to be a meeting of a majority of the governing body where business is or is likely to be discussed. Remote retreats, uh, excuse me, before that, the League of Kansas Municipality meetings or the Kansas Association of County meetings, um, school board meetings, uh, Kansas School Board Association meetings, uh, those wouldn't be a violation of COMA as long as there's not a discussion of specific business of the governmental entity, okay? Remote retreats may be a problem because of lack of public access, okay? Now, the, the, the question is how far is remote, okay? And some of the governments that we have represented, they've had retreats in the next town over or the next county over, okay? There was, um, and it was talked about years ago, there was a government that said, wouldn't it be great, we're in the prairie um, and it's February and there's not much to do here, wouldn't it be great if we had a retreat in California, or not in California, but in Colorado, the one state over. One state over, we're probably talking about uh, very limited access for the public, okay? Uh, if we're talking about a retreat that's maybe off-site, that's fairly common, okay? But it's kind of a sliding scale. There's got to be public access if we're going to have a retreat. We have a very common situation with our TPB, whereby, at least in the past, we've had retreat meetings off-site. Um, at one of the other facilities uh, elsewhere in the in the Sedgwick County region, um, that's very common. So, cereal meetings. And we're not talking about breakfast cereal. But meetings in a series shall be open if they collectively involve a majority of the membership of the body, share a common topic of discussion concerning the business or affairs of the body, and are intended by any or all of the participants to reach agreement on a matter that would require binding action to be taken by the body or agency, okay? Let's talk about that for a minute, all right? How do you establish a meeting? Well, we're all operating today off of devices that are different than what we were operating off of even two years ago here. Uh, we live in an electronic age and Electronic communication is more and more becoming an avenue where a meeting can be established. Um, so it's it's imperative if you're if you're utilizing whatever type of device or means of communication that you're not working towards um, agreement or reaching an agreement 
um, if you're exchanging emails back and forth. That's been a point of emphasis that's come down through direction from the Kansas Attorney General's office, who over the past five or six years has uh, taken a broadened approach towards their um, ongoing oversight and administrative responsibilities for the Kansas Open Meetings Act um, with the passage of additional um, oversight uh, legislation that has been added onto the act in the last few years. Requirements of an open meeting. Notice of the time, place, and date of any meeting or gathering under COMA must be furnished by the presiding officer or other person calling the meeting to any person requesting the information subject to the following qualifications. If the notice is requested by a petition, one person must be designated to receive the notice on behalf of all persons named. Notice to an executive of officer of an employee's organization or trade association is deemed to be notice of, to the entire membership, and the public body may require an annual request for notice to be made to the body, but prior to discontinuing the effectiveness of a current request for notice, the public body must notify the person that the notice will be discontinued unless another request is made. The notice requirement does not require the creation of an agenda. However, if an agenda is created, it must be made available to requesters in advance of the meeting. While the law doesn't require agendas to actually be mailed to requesters, so long as they are otherwise given adequate notice of the meeting, mailing an agenda is an efficient way to comply with the law. We have our agendas, as you'll notice, right near the sign-in table here. Um, that's how several governments and governmental entities throughout the state accomplish that. Mailing is also a fairly efficient way to accommodate that requirement. Outside a meeting, governing body members may communicate by written communication. However, during the meeting, secret ballots and written communication may not be used to deny the public access to the decision-making pro process. So the idea of a straw poll by text message or written communication, secret ballot for, for actual voting, um, that's not something that's, that's entertained. Um, with under the idea that we're going to avoid denying the public access to the decision-making process. Okay. <coughs> Cameras, photographic lights, and recording devices must be permitted into the meeting, but rules may be created to ensure an orderly meeting. Meetings uh, may not be adjourned to another time and place to subvert an open meeting. Okay. Now things come up. Uh, if you're in one situation or another, one facility is being utilized by an entity that we didn't think was going to be utilized, so we have to change the meeting location or start it there and move it somewhere else. These things happen. In an emergency situation, sometimes uh, you have to move facilities, but you, you can't do it to subvert an open meeting. Okay, that can't be its intent. Executive session. Um, executive sessions, uh, an open meeting may be recessed into them uh, upon a motion made and seconded and carried, stating the justification for closing the meeting, the subjects to be discussed, and the time and place of uh, to return to the open meeting. Now, there are several reasons why we can call executive sessions. I'm only going to highlight the ones that are particularly pertinent for our organization in the interest of time. <coughs> personnel matters of non-elected personnel. That's fairly common. Consultation with an attorney for the body or agency, which would be deemed privileged in the attorney-client relationship. Um, matters relating to employer-employee negotiations, whether or not in consultation with the representative or representatives of the body or agency. Confidential data relating to financial affairs or trade secrets of corporations, partnerships, trusts, and individual proprietorships. Um, <clears throat> the next one really has to do with students, public institutions. Um, preliminary discussion relating to the acquisition of real property. Uh, matters relating to security of a public body or agency, uh, public building or facility, or the information system of a public body or agency. If the discussions of such matters at an open meeting would jeopardize the security of such public body, agency, building, facility, or information system. Okay. The next one we're not going to read. It goes more into s security measures. These were added to the statute, I think a little less than a decade ago. Uh, more than five years ago. Um, but at the conclusion of an executive session, the presiding officer should place in the record of the open meeting that no binding action was taken during the executive session. Okay, that's why when we come out, there's that pro forma statement, no binding action was taken during executive session. 
Um, and when we go in, we talked earlier about the, the three or four things that needed to be stated. Uh, there's a penalty. Any member who knowingly violates COMA may be civilly fined up to $500 for each violation. Any binding action which is unlawful is voidable by the Attorney General or the District Attorney in the District within 21 days of the meeting. Also, the District Court has jurisdiction to issue injunctions or writs of mandamus, which is um, a fancy way of saying that, that the court orders you as a public official to do a certain thing because you're required to, um, to enforce provisions of the Act. Additionally, violations of coma may be grounds for ouster. Okay, I think everybody probably knows what ouster is, but removal of a governing body a member from office um, or other public official. If it's found that the public official, quote, willingly neglected to perform any duty enjoined upon him or her by law. Okay. Now we have um, our own uh, bylaws uh, as part of the TPB, uh, slightly different than, uh, than a, a, a city or a county. Um, we operate with a set of bylaws uh, that provides policy as, as to how things um, are accomplished internally. Um, Article 5 of those bylaws is entitled Meetings. 5.1, regular meetings. The TPB shall determine the time, date, and place of its regular meetings, which shall be held in accordance with the schedule of meeting dates approved in the fourth quarter of the preceding calendar year. That's been our tradition if we are uh, considering moving the meeting dates in the fourth quarter of a year. Um, that has been entertained and discussed. Notice of meetings, written notice stating the time, date, and place of all regular meetings and an agenda. Um, enumerating items of business to be considered shall be distributed to each voting representative and non-voting member. Notice to the general public of regular meetings will follow procedures prescribed in the most current public participation plan. That's something that's an internal document that's generated. Special meetings. The chair, secretary, or a majority of the voting members may call special meetings. In calling a special meeting, the requirements of the most current public participation plan may be cons must be considered. Items of business to be considered at special meetings shall be limited to the items listed in the meeting agenda. Um, that's not something that's directly necessarily required underneath COMA, but we have internally developed a policy that we're going to establish an agenda which limits um, the topics of discussion during a special meeting. The secretary shall give public notice and notice to all members of special meetings not less than 24 hours prior to that meeting. Executive sessions, the chair may recess a regular meeting into executive session to deal with personnel and legal matters. Meeting cancellations, the secretary may cancel a regularly scheduled meeting as deemed necessary with the consent of the chair. Quorum, again we're going back to that quorum reference. Um, the presence of the majority of the total voting membership of the TPP shall constitute a quorum. No action shall be taken without a, a quorum of the TPP in attendance at that meeting. Quorum is not lost when one or more members abstain from voting. Okay. If quorum is present at the scheduled meeting time and the chair and vice chair are absent, the secretary or other WAMPO staff representative may call for election of a temporary chair. Upon the arrival of the chair or vice chair, the temporary chair shall relinquish the position upon conclusion of the business item immediately before the TPB. If a quorum is not reached within 15 minutes of the scheduled meeting time, those members present may, by unanimous agreement, elect to continue the meeting as a public information meeting or workshop to discuss items on the agenda that do not require approval or action by the TPB. In this event, the names of the members present at such public information meeting or workshop and brief minutes of items discussed shall be recorded. Quorum of the executive committee shall be the presence of three members. Now we've had it happen more than once here where for one reason or another we have uh, not a quorum uh, for a WAMPO TPP meeting um, and it's operated as such where there's a public information reception um, aspect that, that carries on underneath this provision. Um, and, and if you think about it, really and truly, you're not establishing a meeting under the TPP because one of our two-part tests is not there since we don't have a majority. That's how that's able to function. We're just in a, in a reception mode at that point. No binding action can be taken. Public comment opportunity. Opportunities for public comment shall be provided at each meeting. Locations for all meetings shall be accessible by persons with disabilities. Record of proceedings. The secretary or designee will record a roll of members, minutes, and proceedings and votes and will maintain those records. The minutes recorded are subject to review and approval by the TPB and the secretary shall make them available for public review. 
video and teleconference attendance. Members of the TPB may participate in a meeting by means of conference telephone, video conference device, or similar communications equipment by means of which all persons participating in the meeting can hear each other. Okay? Now, this has been accomplished elsewhere in a myriad of ways, but um, I've seen it where you've just got a video communications, or a tele, I've had, had them where they're video communications devices. You can do it as simply as, as putting a speaker in the middle of a room that allows for the presentation to be heard and participated in by the individuals participating remotely. I've done it by Skype. Last time I did it by Skype, it was early on in the Skype revolution. That's an adventure. Wait till you do your first Skype governing body meeting. It'll be interesting. Um, if communication is lost and cannot be restored in a timely fashion, the person participating through electronic devices will be considered to have left the meeting. That definitely happened when we had the Skype meeting. In that event, the chair will ascertain whether a quorum continues. The lack of quorum present will be addressed through procedures identified above. With that, I don't know whether that was the, the most entertaining. I wonder if that might not have been the, the briefest review of Kansas Open Meetings Act procedure. Um, the endeavor was to put that out before the TPB um, yet yeah, once again. And uh, once again, all of you have uh, obviously probably had this training elsewhere. But I wanted to provide that as a backdrop and then allow for any uh, feedback or questions uh, regarding any of the things that we talked about. If not, uh, move on to the next item. Thank you, Austin. Thank you. Is there any uh, questions? Okay, so it's officially on record that we've had a presentation about open records and open meetings, and so uh, consider yourself learned in that area. <laughs> okay, uh, next, uh, public hearing and an action on the, uh, with Tricia Thomas about the public participation plan. Good afternoon, Trisha Thomas, WAMPO staff. I'll keep this brief, but I'm here to talk about my favorite thing, which is public participation um, and the recent update that we've had to our public participation plan. So, oops, wrong way. <coughs> Almost took you back to coma. Um, so here's the boring part. It's the Code of Federal Regulations, and I just wanted to draw your attention to it so that you knew um, this CFR says that WAMPO shall develop and use a documented plan that defines the process for providing opportunities to be involved in transportation planning. So pretty straightforward. Here's a list of some of the other highlights of the regulation, basically timely and adequate public notice, opportunities for public review and comment at accessible locations. You can re read these, um, not just using words, some visualization techniques here and consultation with other planning agencies and officials. So just take you back to 2015, we did get some feedback, as some of you may remember, on our, public, our current public participation plan. Uh, we were commended for our public engagement and outreach processes, particularly with MOVE 2040. And we also had some recommendations. So these two recommendations dealt with the process for evaluating public engagement strategies as well as the consultation with those agencies and officials that I mentioned earlier. So our current plan was last amended in 2011. It outlined these three goals and it was basically informing the public and engaging them facilitating two-way conversation and evaluating the effectiveness. So the proposed update, we developed this with input from our federal overseers and with KDOT and Wichita Transit. The theme of this new plan is meaningful involvement. So having meaningful opportunities for people to become engaged in the transportation planning process. And it also incorporates our organizational development plan. So here are the updated goals. I tried to build on our old goals, so keeping that informing and engaging, but also involving people early and often in the process and being proactive about coordinating with and among our partners and continuous improvement, so that evaluation part. 
So new and updated aspects of this plan, I just want to draw your attention to those two red items. These two things are the elements that directly address the recommendations from our certification review. So the consultation um, table outlines the other agencies and officials that we should be consulting with and how and when we will do that. And then the evaluation and reporting section of the document just talks about outcomes and how they're tied to those goals that I went over earlier. And I've listed the page numbers here if you, any of you are curious or if you have questions about those other ones. This is just an overview of how um, we've notified people um, of the updated plan. It was open from September 30th through November 30th for review and comment. Um, to date, we've had no significant oral or written comments. That's it. So if anybody has questions, I'm happy to answer them. And if not. Okay. Thanks, Tricia. Any questions for Tricia? I don't think we, we haven't had a problem with our public comment in the past, have we? I mean, well, <laughs> we don't have a lot. Just needs to be, I know, so it just needs to be defined and on yeah. record. Okay. Part of the evaluation <laughs> section, we have set goals to try to increase the number of comments we get. So working a little harder to get some. So okay. we've challenged ourselves a little bit in the next yeah. year. Okay. Yeah. I think Rick has a comment. Yeah. yeah, just a quick question on the evaluation and reporting. That will be a separate report uh, of the public participation or how often will that Yeah, be? that's... Yeah, that's what I'm hoping, that we can go back at the end of the year and look and see where we fell. Um, we've kind of established our own targets, so it'll be an experiment to see if we've exceeded them or if we were too ambitious. So hopefully you, you all will be able to see how we did. Okay. Any other comments? Being, uh, being none, I think this is an action item we need to take a vote on to approve. Before we do, we do have to open it up for a public hearing to the public. This is our last chance oh. for anybody in the public to Does comment on Does anybody in the public want to speak about the public hearing? <laughs> okay. Uh, then we'll bring it back to the policy body. And uh, so now I would entertain a motion to approve. I would make a motion to approve. Thank you, Claire. Second. Second. Thanks, Dan. Been a, a motion and a second. Any other comments? Being none, all in favor by saying aye. Aye. All opposition, being none. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, next is uh, reports from the Kansas Department of Transportation. Mike Moriarty, haven't seen you since Skype earlier this week. <laughs> Did you actually see me or <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> was I visible? I saw one of your others. You were in the room though. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. Uh, no Welcome. update out of Topeka for this meeting other than to say tonight the governor will give his state of the state address. So tune into your favorite media outlet for that one. Um, we expect his budget to be released tomorrow. So I expect next month there should be some more updates from Topeka. Okay. Thanks for that invigorating report, Mike. <laughs> Always count on me for the hard <laughs> commentary. Okay, uh, next. Uh, so Tom Hines not here, but we have a guest. Uh, tell me again. I'm, Zach, is that you? Zach yes. Oswald? Okay. Yes, my name is Zach Oswald. I'm the public affairs manager for South Central Kansas. I'm filling in for Tom. He passed along some information for me to present. Uh, project work was suspended for the holidays and during the extreme cold weather. But work has resumed this week with the warmer temperatures. Uh, when Tom returns, he can provide a more detailed update and answer questions from the board members. Okay. Um, I just comment that the uh, Kellogg, both east and west, and then the traffic seems to be moving nicely during construction. And you're moving <coughs> traffic this way, that way. And some of the businesses that I'm familiar with have. They're pretty pleased that uh, it hadn't been as, as as problematic as they thought it was going to be. So, thanks. It's a good sign. Yeah. I understand. Also, there's a. Did you guys do? Who did the uh, drone flyover? Was that KDOT? 
Okay. Well, some, there's a drone flyover of on the East Kellogg project that's maybe we make that available. People can look at it. It's kind of a about a two and a half minute, about two and a half minute be done monthly. Well, I think that'd be very, uh, we ought to help promote getting that out there. So, okay. Thank you. Uh, next to go to, oh, uh, Steve Spade, Wichita Transit, but I don't believe Steve's here and I don't think there's a report. Is that right? Thank you. And next is the executive committee. We did meet, oh, sorry, Rick. Rick, sorry about that. Oh, no problem. Yeah, Thanks. You're going to do a presentation. So. Yeah, I actually I, have some updates as well to provide. First off, uh, as I was mentioning, alluding to earlier, as everyone's aware, we're going through transition. Just kind of wanted to uh, give a, a few updates. Uh, uh, Elaine Chow has been nominated to be the next Secretary of Transportation. Uh, her experience, she was formerly Deputy Secretary of Transportation under George H.W. Uh, Bush and Secretary of Labor. Uh, her confirmation hearing for the Senate Commerce Committee will be happening tomorrow. So uh, actually, frankly, we're really excited about her because of the, the amount of experience she's going to bring. Uh, in terms of appointments for administrators for Federal Highways FTA, nothing at this point. Uh, landing teams from the administration have come in and they've started to work with us. So more to come after January 20th. But wanted to give an update on a couple of other key things. Uh, yesterday uh, in the Federal Register, Federal Highways announced the last two of MAP21 performance uh, uh, rulemakings that came out. One was on uh, NHS uh, freight movement on the interstate system and CMAC. Um, and the other one was on uh, the performance of bridges on the NHS and pavements on interstate. There's going to be coming, there's going to be guidance coming out and webinars, uh, especially for the member agencies here, not so much, you know, for the MPO, more for your broad information, but more to come. Uh, KDOT will be with us with that. Um, but just wanted to let you all know that was just announced yesterday at TRB. Um, with the transition into the new administration, a lot, I just want to kind of mention to you all that Secretary Fox, one of his key initiatives has been place-based planning. Uh, we had an MPO empowerment meeting in St. Louis in the fall. Uh, Phil Nelson attended, as well as Devonna Moore from KDOT. Uh, there's been a big push by our administration to advance and, and get tools out there on transportation planning, uh, place-based planning. Um, so much so that in December on the 19th, um, there were two metro areas that were selected in this country for a special leadership academy. And the intent of this with the administration is to get out there and work with the communities to get some thoughts about how do they get the public involved. So the timing of the participation plan approval is opportune. But how do you get the public energized, wanting to be involved in the planning process? One of the uh, one of these leadership academies took place in Seattle. The second one was in Kansas City at Mar with Mark participating. It was on December 19th. Uh, great turnout. We also had KDOT, uh, Devonna Moore, and, and other folks. Um, the department has created a, a toolkit that's really focused in on public involvement. You know how do how does the public get involved? Um, we we supported that uh, workshop at with Mark's uh, cooperation as well, along with FAA and FTA. So just wanted to mention that, and there was actually a short video that was, all this has been going on since mid-December, and what I would forecast is even in the next two weeks, you may be seeing more initiatives in terms of planning and support from us as this administration transitions into the next. But thought I would share this video that was produced on December 19th, and it was literally on the day of the Kansas City workshop, so. Thank you. <clears throat> the public is the voice that can impact policy discussions. They're the voice that can demand changes that need to happen. If you don't have public engagement, you're really just guessing about how you want to impact people that you care about. The public, unfortunately, in transportation is brought in after many of the decisions are made. Too much of our transportation conversations are talking about transportation. 
without personal skin in the game. There's many people in my area that feel like they have no voice. We believed that for the long term of our country's needs, we need a more engaged and more informed public. planning process can be mysterious and it shouldn't be it should be accessible one of the reasons that people are not as involved in the decisions that affect their communities and their families is because they don't understand the process it's really complicated the every place counts leadership academy is an interactive workshop for individuals and communities that enables them to engage more meaningfully in the transportation process. Let's just be honest, there's the process and there's the process. And part of what we're trying to do is to arm people with a knowledge of how the process works, where they can make the most impact so they can advance the issues they care about. The decision makers need to hear from communities and better understand what their needs are, what their aspirations are, and then it helps them make better decisions. I wanted to have better tools and just get better educated on how to have a better impact with transportation in my area. The community I live, people are struggling with the transit issue, especially those people who does not have a voice in transit planning level because of the limit of English. I'm hoping for some fresh thinking for myself and for other people. The public is the constant, and if they are engaged and they feel empowered to speak their minds and demand the things they need, um, the transportation system will respond. The Transportation Toolkit was created to demystify and guide you from start to finish through the bureaucratic and oftentimes confusing decision-making process. How does transportation connect you and your community to opportunities like work, school, and health care? How do you solve transportation challenges in your area once you identify them? If you have no prior experience in your local government, how do you present yourself as an emerging transportation leader? The toolkit guides you and your community through that process. The toolkit from this academy it gives people an understanding of how the transportation process really works. It's set up for people to be able to use it without us having to walk them through it. And so people can download it, they can print it out, they can shape it to their own needs. It's designed to be very flexible and you don't have to be connected at the hip with the USDOT in order to use it. What I've learned here today with the Leadership Academy is to how to speak, you know, to officials. And now I'll have the tools to be more effective as I, you know, now have a better understanding about the protocols. And I'm very happy that I decided to participate in the Leadership Academy. I'm so, so happy, and, you know, I came here. And I hope I can come back again here, you know, for more resources I can put in my community. <coughs> All of the power of government comes right from the people. So if they have a better sense of their role and that their voice influences change, that's a very powerful thing. To find out more about the Leadership Academy, please visit our website, www.transportation.gov slash Leadership Academy. There, you can download and print out the Transportation Toolkit, share this video, and you'll discover information on how to host your own academy. Invite a diverse group of people from your community to attend so we can all learn, engage, and make a difference together. Very good. Thank you. Just wanted to share that, and <clears throat> this toolkit is readily available. I know that. Uh, Right now, Mark is in the process of develop, updating their public participation plan, and they're going to be using a lot of this information. But it's meant to be, uh, as it was stated, demystify the process for a lot of the public that 
don't understand what a 3C process is and that type of thing. So again, this is part of the push for the administration. Uh, Secretary Fox, this has been a really personal issue for him to try to get more public participation in planning. So just wanted to share that as, as coming on board here. So thanks. Well, thanks, Rick. No, that's, that's very uh, informational. So I think Phil will look into that. At, uh, next meeting update. Any other questions for for Rick? Comments. Okay. Moving on, we um, <clears throat> next is the uh, report to the executive committee. We did have a, a meeting this past uh, month with the executive team. Uh, we we discussed uh, uh, more a little more detail about the uh, becoming more autonomous as a as Wampo. You know the breakup the break off from the city of Wichita. Um, we also uh, uh, feel, uh, and we discussed uh, continuing uh, further relationship building in, in a regional approach, and that being, you know, with REAP, with Bragg, with uh, either even ICT Health and uh, the Downtown Development Corporation. So um, if any of you have uh, regional groups that we think uh, that they ought to know about WAMP or WAMP ought, ought to be involved with them as well. Uh, I think we'd uh, be very open for that. <clears throat> we also discussed a little bit that uh, WAMP has taken a little more active role of the staff in providing uh, mapping tools for cities and, and smaller cities that don't have the uh, tools to, to do uh, geographic mapping and, and things like that. So feel free to uh, bring that message back to your uh, to your communities that, that WAMPO is ready to serve. <clears throat> so um, that was the extent of most of our uh, executive meeting. If there's any questions, be glad to feed those. Okay. And then uh, the next would be the uh, TAC report. Tom? The significant thing we did in the TAC this past, uh, the last meeting, was uh, we set up a task team uh, that rec recommended people that ended up volunteering to be on the team that's going to look at how we will spend the dollars that end up at the end of the year on our books. Uh, they're going to bring back a recommendation, probably going to take about three months, so I'm looking at either probably about April uh, to bring that recommendation back to us. Um, it will go back through the TAC and into policy body. Uh, right now as a chair I think or not, I don't know if she's chair she's bringing that together and set up the meetings pardon okay um, the only other thing I've got and it's not part of the tech but it's something I get an email the other day on at uh, part of item B um, <coughs> on our outreach and our training and, and things that we're trying to do in the community I noticed that the uh, bike ped people are really excited because Phil's doing two presentations this week think this week yes. or, on uh, what's going on up here and the opportunities for bike pit improvements. So thank you, Phil. For doing that. All I got. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, we're trying to support, uh, I think we're trying to connect what Cheney all the way to Augusta on a bike close to Andover. Andover. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Okay. Um, well, that's be we're at the end of our agenda. Is there any other uh, comments from or any any information to share? Yes, James. Uh, as chair of the Central County Association of Cities, I wanted to make sure that I put out an invitation to all the council members and mayors that are here to feel free to join us on Saturday. We're going to have um, uh, Karen Page uh, with World Trade Council there talking about how exports are, are going to be. Uh, Key to success for all our communities, um, especially those in Central County, and are definitely transportation um, needs that will help. Uh, please, if if you're able to, we'd love to have you. We're going to have breakfast, and it'll be at Cowtown, and uh, so come enjoy a good breakfast discussion about um, uh, regional exports. Okay, and then I think uh, <clears throat> that reminds me also. There's there was a. Uh, uh, election and then there's some change of offices in some of our communities or counties so if uh, 
that I think well Cedric for sure. So we will have some uh, replacement and new policy body members at the next meeting. So feel free if you have one yourself to communicate with myself or Phil and let us know so we can get that taken care of. Sarah didn't understand what yeah, you were I just didn't. saying. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't okay. quite get that. <laughs> All right. Uh, with that, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. All right. Moved and seconded. We are adjourned.